Ladies and gentlemen, so may I now uh, introduce our next speaker, who indeed is our former speaker at the same time. Sean, how do you do that? Uh, if you haven't Sean, uh, met Sean, uh, let me just quickly remind you that Sean is a principal scientist and software architect for Adobe's mobile digital imaging group. And he's been with Adobe since 93, uh, when he joined as a senior engineer working on Photoshop and later managed Adobe's software technology lab. In 09, he spent a year at Google working on Chrome OS before returning to Adobe. And from 88 through to 93, Sean worked at Apple, where he was part of the system software team that developed the technologies allowing Apple's successful transition to power PC. And I was trying to find out something personal, something informal about Sean, uh, and I couldn't. So I asked for help, and the person helping me was Michael Wong, whom you met uh, yesterday morning. And about Sean, Michael Wong said, and I quote, Sean is one of the most respected guys in C++ and one of the easiest going people I've ever met, unquote. Ladies and gentlemen, better code concurrency by Sean Parent. Thank you. Thank you. I'm really enjoying being at the conference here. It's a good conference. Um, Today I wanted to talk a bit about concurrency. To put this talk a little into context, a few years back at uh, Going Native, which is now CppCon, I gave a talk called C++ Seasoning that was fairly well received, and I got a lot of requests after that to put together a book. So since then, when I get invited to give a talk, uh, I've been working through a section of the book as part of doing the talk. Uh, so right now, kind of this is where we are. Uh, this is one of my more recent talks. Now there's a common theme in all of these talks, which is that writing better code is about managing relationships, and I don't mean that as personal relationships, although I think computer scientists are bad at both. It's about understanding the fundamentals. Okay. It's about learning to code simply, and part of that is learning to reason locally and equationally about your code. Okay. Now to give you some idea of the kind of things I work on, uh, this is a screenshot. I didn't want to risk a live demo here. Uh, but this is a screenshot from uh, Lightroom for the web. So how many people are familiar with Adobe Lightroom? A handful of people. Well, this is a professional photography photo imaging product. And we now have a mobile version. And one of the jobs that I did was took the desktop rendering system and got it running on mobile devices, uh, first iOS and then Android. Uh, and then I decided, well, maybe I could get it running inside the browser. And to put this in perspective, uh, uh, you can't do a subset of the Photoshop of the Photoshop Lightroom rendering system and have a product because it's a non-destructive model. It's a parametric model. So rendering is always done live. So if you want to be able to display an edit that was done on the desktop for the same image on mobile or on web, you have to be able to render everything, all of the features that the desktop has on mobile and web. Okay. Uh, so at first, we were targeting Pinnacle, which is, for people who don't know, that stands for Portable Native Client, which is a technology that's built into the Chrome browsers and Chromebooks uh, and uh, you know, Chrome, regardless of what machine it's running on. And basically what Pinnacle is, is it lets you compile code into an intermediate representation that looks an awful lot like LLVM. Uh, uh, intermediate representation, and then the back end of the compiler is built into the browser, and they have a secure sandboxing technology. So you can basically run multi-threaded, near-native performance, C++ code inside the browser. How many people knew that? Almost nobody. Yeah, few people. Uh, it's a really an interesting technology and really worth playing with. Um, uh, but this is not inside of Chrome. This is inside of, of Apple's uh, Safari. Uh, to give you an idea of how 
much has changed in that image. That's the original image. I shot that in the Moscow subway. Um, uh, and that's the edited image. And that's all rendered in JavaScript, okay? But it's C++ code compiled with the mscriptum compiler into JavaScript. Now the main challenge to get this imaging pipeline, it's about a 40 stage imaging pipeline, largely CPU based, this is not OpenGL code, uh, to get this run, running high performance inside of JavaScript uh, was a challenge. All of the performance issues were a challenge, but the biggest hurdle to get here was the fact that this was a heavily threaded code base and JavaScript doesn't have threads. Okay, so I had to get a heavily threaded code base running inside of JavaScript and running so that it gave interactive performance. So if you, as you slide the sliders in this, the screen updates and everything feels smooth and live. Okay. So this project got me thinking a lot about the issues of concurrency and how we go about it. First, some definitions, okay? Concurrency is when tasks run and complete in overlapping time periods, right? A task you can typically think of as a function, okay? But it doesn't mean the same thing as parallelism. Parallelism is when things actually run simultaneously. I can have concurrency even though I have a, a single thread of execution, okay? I can do that by time slicing the thread. I can do that by having a cooperative threading model, okay? Or I can do that by breaking up tasks and requeuing the tasks. Those are all forms of concurrency. Okay. The reason why you want concurrency is concurrency is the basic building block that allows you to get to parallelism okay, which improves the performance of your application. It also allows you to improve the interactivity, right? So you can build a usable application where the user isn't blocked from taking the next step. Now all of my talks, except for my overview talk that we saw, saw yesterday, all of my other talks uh, have a goal. And this is the goal for today's talk. No raw synchronization primitives. All of my goals are stated as a negative. What not to do. They're non-prescriptive. They don't tell you what to do, okay? And all of these goals are not rules. They're not even guidelines. I don't want people in code reviews to say, Sean said no raw synchronization primitives, so get those out, okay? They are goals that are difficult to achieve. Achieving them will make your code better, but I cannot tell you how to do this in all circumstances. We'll discuss some ways to do it and some reasons why they're a problem here, okay? But this is an open-ended problem, something for all of you to strive for. So what's a raw synchronization primitive? Well, these are mutexes, atomics, semaphores, memory fences, condition variables. How many people have at least used one of these in a coding project, almost everybody good, which means if I say how many people have written anything with threads, same people. <laughs> okay, so you're all somewhat familiar with those. The reason why you don't wanna use them, the number one reason is you'll likely get it wrong. Okay, and I know this because almost everybody I know gets these wrong. Here's a piece of code that I wrote, and I actually renamed this class to be bad cow. It was originally copy on write, which is cow. Um, the reason why it's bad cow is because I put this on a slide at one point without naming it bad cow, and somebody promptly copied this bad code and put it into a shipping product. So now it's a bad cow. So right there, in this code, there's a bug, okay? Count M is an atomic. Now this bug shipped, I wrote this bug, so I'll take full responsibility for it. It took over a year to find this bug. Can anybody spot the bug? I have a couple hands, yell it out. 
what we're doing here, this is a ref counted object, okay? So if a count is one, that implies single ownership, nobody else has access to it, and if the count is one, the count can't change, okay? So if the count is one, we can safely just assign straight into here without any fear of a race condition, and we're good, okay? If the count is not one, okay, then we need to construct a new object and decrement our count. Now the problem here is every time we decrement our count, if our count goes to zero, we should delete the old object, okay? Because if the count goes to zero, nobody else owns it, including us, so it needs to go away, okay? So what could happen here is when we do the first check, we say it's equal to one, and that's false, so somebody else owns this object. But by the time we get two lines, three lines down below that, okay, whoever else owned this object has given up ownership, and now the count is one, and we decrement it, and it hits zero, but we don't test for that zero, we don't delete the object, and we leak whatever that object pointed to, okay? So inside the compiled code, there is a function call in the middle to new, so th there's actually a fairly large gap of time in there for this race condition to occur. But in production, what this meant was about once every three to four hours, the system would leak one object, okay? So not a huge deal, but it kept showing up on our leak detection, and this was a pain to actually find, and it's pretty subtle, okay? So the fix is that we have to, when we decrement, check for zero, okay? Now the problem with this code is if you're not reading this code very carefully, that looks like a redundant check, right? And so even if you wrote this code to begin with, in all likelihood, an engineer in your building a year from now is going to be skimming over this piece of code and going, going, what's this check? It clearly can't be zero, okay? Because it wasn't one, right? The only way we could get to zero is if we decremented one. It clearly can't be zero, and they're gonna take that line out and reintroduce the bug. So if you do that, put a comment in there too, okay. So you're gonna get it wrong. The other reason why you don't wanna use raw synchronization primitives is performance. Let me give you some understanding of why. This is a graph that a colleague of mine, uh, Russell Williams, he's on the Photoshop team, put together a couple years ago. Uh, so this is looking at a Sandy Bridge machine uh, and this graph has only gotten worse since then. It's still a little better than this on mobile devices. So this gives you a good slice. But this is a graph of where is the performance in your machine, okay? That much of the performance of your machine as far as just raw gigaflops is in the GPU. So it's a pretty traditional desktop box, okay? That much of performance is in the vectorization in the SIMD unit on your machine. Maybe if you have auto vectorization in your compiler, you're touching that just touching it. That much performance is in multi-core, so if you're at least coding with threads, if you're using C++ 11 or better, you get some access to that. And that is the slice on this machine if you're just writing single-threaded, non-SIMD optimized, non-GPU accelerated code on your machine. That slice is 0.25% of the overall performance capabilities of this machine. So if you're not writing parallel code, you've got a problem, okay? Now, Michael Wong gave his talk here on day one. How many people attended Michael's talk? Yeah, so Michael mentioned that I challenged him. The basic challenge was how do we, with C++, unlock this whole thing, okay? So, and that's what Michael's been working on since. What I'm gonna talk about today is how do we move off the bottom mark, right? Which is a big challenge in and of itself.
Now, how many people are familiar with Amdahl's Law? A few people. Everybody needs to be aware of this. Okay. Amdahl's Law basically states, right, that the amount of performance that you can get out of your machine is limited by the piece that you can't speed up. Okay. So the way that this translates to, to accelerating when you have multiple cores is if you have 10% of your code which is synchronized, okay, then it doesn't matter how many cores you throw at that machine, you can't go more than 10 times faster. Okay, because that 10% will be your limit. You will approach it and never hit that and never exceed it. Now, this is the graph that you'll find if you look up Amdahl's Law on Wikipedia. This graph drives me nuts. Why does this graph drive me nuts? It does not give you the proper sense of scale. It is logarithmic on the bottom axis and it is linear on the top axis. Okay? So if I made this linear on both axes, we'd be about in the states going this direction. Okay? Doesn't matter which direction we'd pointing, we'd go about halfway around the planet. So this really doesn't give you a sense of scale of the problem. So this is a more meaningful graph of Amdahl's law. This is linear on both axes. Okay? Each line represents just 10% synchronization to see how fast you're falling off there. Okay? So if you look here, the numbers are pretty small. If I can see four, five, six, so that's seven. So out at, uh, we're out at 16 cores here. Sorry for the blurriness and the small type on this display. But we're out at 16 cores here on this side. Okay, and that I think is a little better than six X performance. So if we just have 10% synchronization, okay, and 16 cores on our machine, we're just doing a little bit better than six times faster, right? The red line is just a straight linear scale, okay? So just a little bit of blocking, a little bit of synchroniz synchronization, which is what raw synchronization primitives do, kills your performance. Now everybody thinks about threading as this model. They think, oh, I've got an object and I've got a bunch of threads that are going to be banging on that object and so I'm going to throw in a mutex, right, to only let one thread bang on that object at a time and each thread will acquire the lock and will just rotate around. This is a horrible way to write threaded code. Don't do that. Don't stop. We want to minimize our locks. A couple more terms here, which we've been using already, but let's go ahead and define them. So a thread is an execution environment. It consists of a stack, processor state, potentially running in parallel to other threads. Okay, it can be time sliced, could be just running concurrent with other threads if you've exceeded the number of cores you have on the machine. Okay, a task is a unit of work, often just a function that's executed on a thread. So those are our two different terms. Tasks can be scheduled on a thread pool to op optimize the machine utilization. Right? This is a very common technique. Right? Unfortunately, C++14 does not really have a task system. It's got threads and it's got futures and it's something called, it's got something called async, which in C++11 was pretty well nailed down to say that async will execute a task on a, on a new thread. And in C++14, that definition got weakened a little bit, largely because of Microsoft's arguments, which we'll get to in a bit, um, uh, to say, well, maybe that task could get executed on a thread pool. But that's the best we have. But regardless of what platform you're working on, almost, you probably have something better, right? I'm going to show you how to write a portable implementation here uh, for a thread pool in a minute. Uh, Windows, though, has Windows Thread Pool and PPL. Apple has something called Grand Central Dispatch, which is LibDispatch. LibDispatch is also open sourced, and you can find it available on most Linux systems. Uh, you can also bring it up on Android. 
Uh, Intel has something called TBB, which is available both as an open source license and a commercial license and available for many platforms, including ARM, not just Intel processors. And uh, HPX, uh, which is largely about how you do uh, high performance computing, but it's also fairly scalable, will run down on smaller machines, is available on, on smaller devices. So you probably already have a thread pool available. So even though I'm going to walk through how you build one, it's for instructive purposes. Don't write your own. Okay? Uh, the reason why I wrote my own here, the reason why I went through this experiment is because I was trying to get to, like I said, to port all this code to Google's Pinnacle, and I didn't have a task system there, and libdispatch would have been the closest fit for what I wanted, uh, but libdispatch requires libkernel, and I didn't have a libkernel either. So I ended up writing my own. Now, if you look online about how to write a task system, uh, way down here in type you can't see, it's a link to the Oracle website. You'll find the uh, Oracle guide to writing concurrency code, and they will tell you how to write a task system. And this is what they'll tell you. Well, you just need a queue, and you're going to put tasks into the queue, and then you're going to feed tasks out of the queue and put them on each thread. OK? So we can write that. We're going to have a lock. We're going to write a notification queue, which is really just built on top of an STL deck. OK? We're going to have a pop function to pop a piece of work out of the queue. We're going to have a push function to add a piece to the queue. OK? Now we're going to write a little task system that just contains one of these queues, OK? And a bunch of threads. One thread for each piece of concurrency we have. Okay. We are going to uh, uh, have a run loop, which is just going to spin in a loop and pop functions off of our work queue and execute them. So we'll construct our task system, spin up all of our queues, and point them to our run loop. When we destruct our set task system, we want to join all of our queues. Okay. Now, this won't quite work, right? We're going to join all of our queues, but if you actually look, our run loop never terminates there, so we're going to have to fix that. Okay, so we'll fix that in a moment. And then we're going to have an async operation here that just pushes a piece of work onto our queue. Okay, so let's fix this up. We need to add a done function, so we're going to have a, a little done flag there. A done that sets done under our lock and notifies all the, all the threads to wake up with our condition variable. Okay. Our pop, pop function now will return a bool. It will check for done, and it will return what does it return there? It returns a uh, False if we're done. True if we actually popped. So that's our complete system. How well do you guys think this performed? Here's our speedometer. Anybody? Fast, slow, great? Depends on the task size. Let's say small tasks under load. OK. So we're trying to measure the overhead of this tasking system like that, really badly, really, really, really badly. Okay, why? Well, we did exactly what I told you not to do. We've got one queue, we've got a bunch of threads banging on it, and we've got a whole mutex around the thing, and we're doing that. Okay, but that's what Oracle will tell you to do. So how do we fix this? Right, we want to do better than that. Anybody know? Many queues. That's the right answer. OK, so now what we're going to do is we're going to have a little mini scheduler, which is just going to put our work into one of many queues. And then each thread will pull from its queue. So this is pretty easy. We don't have to change our queue. We can just change our task system. So now up on top there, you see we've got a vector of queues, right? One for every, every thread we're going to spin up. And down here now, when we pop, or with our run, our run's going to take an argument which says, 
which of our cues we're going to pop from. And down here, when we do our async, we're going to push into the next queue available, and we're just going to keep a count, and we're just going to walk around. So pretty straightforward. OK, how do you guys think this one does? Question over here. Right. So the comment there was he has a problem with this solution because one of these threads is going to chew through all of its work and there's going to be tasks piled up behind another thread because it's got a long running task and things are going to stall out. We're not going to fully utilize the machine. So we'll get to that in a moment. Right? So how do we think this is going to do? Overall, nobody? A little better. OK? It's actually about 10 times better. OK? But it's a little better. So the solution is something called task stealing. Who's ever heard the term task stealing? Somebody's heard task stealing, or is that a question? <laughs> yep. So a few people have heard the idea of task stealing. So this is what task stealing is. When I have multiple queues in my system, right, if I come along to one thread and I'm out of work, right, just steal work from another thread or from another queue, OK? And I can even do better than that. If I go to take a piece of work out of my queue and my queue is busy, right, maybe because somebody else is putting information into it or because another task is already stealing information from my queue, then I'll just go steal work from somebody else's queue. OK? So instead of blocking and waiting, I will do that. So how would we write this? Well, we're going to modify our notification queue just a little bit. We're going to have two functions here try pop and try push, OK? And the idea is that try pop is going to attempt to pop something, but if the queue is empty or if it just can't acquire the lock because the lock is busy, OK, then it's just going to return and say, nope, didn't get anything, OK? And try push is going to do the same thing. If it goes to try to push into something and that queue is busy, OK, then it's going to return and say, no, I couldn't put anything in here. So we'll do those two functions. OK, so now what we're going to do inside of our tasking system here is our run loop up on top there. OK, what we're going to do is we're just going to, to spin around trying to pop things out. OK? So we'll just walk around. If we don't get anything, once we've gone all the way around, then we'll just sit, sit and wait on our pop. OK? Now our push in, we can be a little more aggressive here, right? right. On the try there, we want to eventually settle out on that on that pop and wait for it because people are notifying us. We need the guarantee that every time we get one notification, we pop at least one thing. Okay? But on the push, we can be a little more aggressive and we can spin more times. Okay? So there's a K factor in here as to how many times around we spin. Okay? And K will depend actually on your hardware a little bit. So a number somewhere between 32 and, and 56 times, 64 times, something in there is going to be the ideal. If you had to just pick a number out of thin air, set it to be 48, and you'll be within a couple percentage points of ideal. OK? OK. Now, there are much more sophisticated task stealing algorithms okay, that require lock-free data structures, and all kinds of sophistication going on. But this is just a dead simple way to code it. OK, now how do you guys think we do? Have we pegged it yet? In the middle? Well, we're actually doing a little bit better. We're way up here. OK. So now we're at the point where you could start to look at things, much more sophisticated data structures. Now we're at the point where doing something like a lock-free queue 
would make a difference and kick you up a couple percentage points. We're doing a sophisticated task stealing, lock free task stealing algorithm would kick you up a couple more percentage points. Okay? By having hooks into the kernel to being able to balance against the, the, the other threads in the operating system to make sure that you're not over utilizing all of your cores would kick you up another couple percentage points. Now you're down to the fine tuning points. Now one problem that I have is we did all of this sitting on top of a deck, which is not a particularly efficient data structure with a big mutex around it. Okay? But what we did is we greatly minimized the amount of time that we're sitting in that mutex. And all too often, I see people come along and say, oh, I wrote this thing with one queue and it's slow, and they start pulling out memory barriers and, and lock-free devices, and they try to tune the queue, okay? And that's the wrong approach. So what is pegged on this scale, which is the best tasking system I found, is actually Apple's libdispatch, right? Performance-wise under load, this performs better than any I've used. So that's my 1.0 on my scale. That's my pegging it. That's my max that I've been benchmarking against. And these are actual benchmark times here for all of these. these. Against that is a gold standard. Okay. Now that code, if you look it up as an open source code base, is a very large library and a very sophisticated library. Right? Right? And it's very well tuned and very hard to match. So, but what I just showed you here on a, on, with a few slides is we can come within 15% of that mark before we start going to sophisticated, clever solutions. Right? Right? And that's an important thing to understand. Right? When you're looking at where your code is spending time, right? the idea is to get rid of those blocks, to get rid of those places where you're actually acquiring the mutexes and to minimize the contention. This is a C++14 compatible async written with libdispatch. Fits on one slide. Um, my slides are available online, so you guys can grab this offline. I don't expect you to remember it. Uh, uh, but, you know, libdispatch is the C library that people think is hard to use. It's actually pretty easy to adapt into a nice C++ interface. So if you've used STD async, this is STD async written in terms of libdispatch. We're going to talk about a couple of issues with doing that, though. I gave this talk a while back at C++ Now, and somebody in the audience berated me afterwards for quite some time that I didn't look at Boost ASIO. Okay? Uh, the ASIO library has been submitted for standardization, and so his contention was that ASIO was the de facto tasking system for C++ because it had been submitted for standardization, and it was very heavily tuned uh, and very high performance. And it is in, for, some, for some respects, but it's actually a very bad tasking system. First of all, it isn't a tasking system, but you can use it to build a tasking system. So this is a tasking system built out of Boostasio. Okay? So the problem here is the model is wrong. It might be fixable, but it would be a difficult fix to happen in the same API, because basically what we've got is we've got a single object that we're going to be banging on from multiple threads. Okay? Now, they have a very sophisticated lock-free queue, at least from what I understand. I haven't read the code in that much detail. But their performance on my bar here is exactly the same as my first very simple implementation with a single queue. Now, that's not quite true. They do beat my performance, uh, but it's not measurable to the first two decimal places. Okay. So that's Boostasio. Don't think it's a tasking system. So the next thing, then once you have a tasking system up, you need to learn how to use this. So what we want to do is spin up a task. At some point, you're going to want your task to create some object that you want to communicate to another task that's going. And your system keeps running, right? At some point, you need these tasks to be able to communicate. So how do we do that? 
Anybody? Do we already have a mechanism in the language? Futures. We do have a mechanism. Right? So here's futures. Okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to asynchronously calculate a Fibonacci number for a million using uh, uh, multi-precision boost integers, because that's a very big number. And then we're going to get our future result and print it. And I'm going to take a little digression here. How many people have seen Fibonacci used as an example in a talk on parallelism or concurrency? Oh, far fewer people than I would expect. Usually everybody's hand goes up. Because Fibonacci is the canonical example used. And I hate this. I hate Fibonacci being used because everybody calculates Fibonacci in the most brain dead way. Okay? It is my pet peeve. So for you guys in the audience, we're going to fix it. You guys are going to learn really quickly how to calculate Fibonacci. The first thing you need to calculate Fibonacci is a generalized power function. So this is a generalized power function. Okay? It's relatively straightforward. It's the same structure as an adder, right? So what I can do here is I can feed in a number as x, the power I want to raise it to in the operation, right? So if my operation is addition, then this does multiplication. Okay? And if my operation is multiplication, then it raises the thing to the power. Okay? So this is just a generic form of power. Should be an STL, but isn't. Okay. This is also known as the Egyptian multiplication or the Russian peasant algorithm. See Alex Stepanov's book from Mathematics for Generic Programming if you want a whole bunch of discussion about this, how and why it works. Okay, given that, we can write an operation which is just to multiply a two by two matrix. Okay. And then in order to plug it in, we need the notion of an identity element. And now to calculate Fibonacci, all we have to do is raise what's known as a Fibonacci matrix, which is a very simple matrix to a given power. It relies on this equation right here. That's the Fibonacci matrix on the left raised to a power n. And those are the Fibonacci numbers that fall out, right? So you can see the nth Fibonacci number is in the middle. We actually don't have to go that far, which is why you'll see this is n minus 1, because that would give us fn in the top left corner. OK? So all we have to do is raise a Fibonacci matrix to the nth power, and we calculate Fibonacci. And so what I did was exactly this, asynchronously. And this slide takes a moment to load. This is Fibonacci for a million. Okay, so that's 208,000 digits, and that calculated in 0.72 seconds on one core, not parallelized on my machine. So for anybody who's using Fibonacci, please stop. Okay, that's how you calculate Fibonacci. But we're going to do it asynchronously for a million here. Okay, so what is a future? Getting back to our talk. Conceptually, what a future is, is we have a function that returns some result. Function takes some number of arguments, returns some result. And what we want to do is split the result from the function. So we can say, go execute that function someplace else, and we've got a token for the result that we can somehow view later and get the result out of it. Okay? So we've separated those two halves, the execution of the function from where the result goes, and those two can now flow independently in the system, but somehow they're magically connected between them. Right? It's not too magic, it's just shared state. Okay. So what futures allow is minimum code transformation to express dependencies. Right? What that is, is this result depends on the execution of that function. Okay, so futures also provide exception marshalling in C++, which is quite nice. So if we wrote this function that just throws a runtime error, okay, and then on the other side, when we actually go to get the value, it will print out failure. So even though we threw an exception in one thread, we get to catch the exception in the other thread. That's because the exception was marshaled through our future. So this gives us a nice way to start to think about task communication. Well, we can think about it 
as our model for task communication is we take some task with a set of arguments, okay, and we split it. So we're hanging on to a future on one side and we send those arguments over to be issued as another task. It executes the code and then we call future.get and what happens? And we block, we get the result, but we block. And we don't like blocking, right? I want every time you guys think future.get, think shutter, okay? We don't like that. It doesn't take much of that and our system crawls. Okay, but it works, our result comes over. Features lacking in C++14. Now, some of these are in the TS. Some of them are not. Uh, Michael covered some of this. Continuations, right? What a continuation is, is, is the ability for us to say, okay, after this function, I want you to do this thing next. Win all is a way to join things. Split. There's no split even in the TS, so we're gonna write one here. Um, there's no cancellation in the TS, and there's no good way to layer it. We'll talk about what that is in a minute inside of the current TS. There's no progress monitoring. We're gonna ignore that because it's too long to talk about here, but I think it should be part of the system. Other than now we have is ready, which will tell us whether or not a future is ready. But there's no way to see how far along in the asynchronous calculation we are. Um, that's very important if you're trying to give the user some kind of feedback. And finally, C++14 futures don't compose very easily to add these. Right. But let's. Let's talk about them a little bit. This is what a continuation is, right? Circles are functions. Boxes are values, are results. So we got a function yielding a result and we want to give that to another function yielding a result. Okay. So, why do we want to do this? Well, as I already mentioned, future.get has a problem. The first problem is a performance problem in that it causes us to stop. The second problem is actually worse and much more subtle, possibly, possibly causing deadlock in our tasking system. Okay, this is a really bad problem. Okay, so part of slowing us down is it means any subsequent non-dependent calculations on the task are also blocked from executing. Now all of these other systems have, all, have some form of continuation, some form of, of system to solve this. What do I mean by a possible deadlock? I first hit this issue taking the Lightroom rendering code to mobile. And that when we scaled down to two cores, we deadlocked almost constantly. It took a huge amount of effort to figure out what was going on and why we were deadlocking. And you'll understand why in a moment. When we finally figured it out, we realized that we had seen the same issue running on eight cores and 16 cores on desktop machines. It was just much less frequent, but the same problem was there. Here's what happens. Let's just say I've only got one thread. And I've got a task executing, and that task spawns another task that goes into my queue and then calls git. It's pretty easy to see that that's an immediate deadlock. Okay, so if I only have one thread in my thread pool, then any calls to dot git or dot wait are just a deadlock. Well, what happens if I have two threads in my thread pool? I issue two tasks, one starts executing immediately, the other one's queued up behind it. This guy's waiting for that to complete. This guy issues a task and he's waiting for him to complete. No task stealing will help you here. I have no threads available to steal a task, okay? Now, the more threads you have in the thread pool, the least likely you are to hit the situation. 
But the problem with hitting this situation is if you hit this situation and you've got eight cores executing, okay, what you have when you're sitting in the debugger is a bunch of tasks that are blocked that have no interdependencies. It's not like an ABA style, style block, right? So they all seem to be independent, yet nobody's making forward progress, okay? So it's very unclear what the dependencies are that led to this, right? And at this point, these two guys are completely independent. They're both just stuck, okay? And the problem with this is it's very time independent, right? Whether or not you get stuck depends on what order the tasks end up in the queue and who steals what from the queue when and exactly how things fall out. Right? So this is one of those vexing bugs where if you hit this, this will be a deadlock in your system once a week, okay? And you will stare at this thing in the debugger and have no clue, why am I stuck? That's what happened to me. Now the problem there, as I said earlier on, is STD async because Herb Sutter argued with the standards committee because Microsoft would really rather you not spin up threads and do everything through the thread pool, but Microsoft's PPL has continuations and tries to discourage locking at all, uh, argued that STD async should not spin up a new thread. So by STD async not spinning up a new thread, returning a future that doesn't have continuations where the only way to get a value out of it is to call dot .get or dot .wait, means that right now in C++14, you have a system that's as defined, guaranteed to give you deadlocks at some point. Okay? It's not cool. Okay. And it's not just Git, right? Any blocking call, any continuation variable will cause this problem. But let's keep going. Let's look at the positive here. So here I'm using the boost library uh, for futures, which has continuations. Okay, so this is what a continuation looks like, right? I can calculate some Fibonacci number. I'm doing smaller numbers now. We'll calculate 1,000. And then I can say, then after you calculate that, uh, print it. Okay, and that will do that. So that's how continuations work. Now frequently you'll hear in the community argue arguments about the difference between futures and callbacks, okay, or completion handlers, right, which is another form of callbacks, okay. And people will be very religious about what side of that argument they're on, right, whether or not your tasking system should work with completion handlers or whether or not your tasking system should work with futures. Well, here's the trade-offs, okay. So completion handlers are great if you know what you're going to do next at the time that you make the asynchronous call, okay? Because what you're doing is you're saying, here's my continuation, I'm going to tell it to you in advance. And that removes one point of synchronization, right? At the point on a future where I attach a continuation clause, Okay. That's a synchronization point because I'm attaching my continuation call and there may be a value already in flight and so I need some form of, of synchronization there. It might be a, an atomic, it might be very small, it might be lock free, but there's still a synchronization point there and it still applies to Amdahl's law. So futures are always going to impose some performance penalty, okay, over just a completion handler. But futures let you compose things after the fact. Right? You don't have to know where you're going next. And this is very important if you're in a dynamic system. Right? If you go off with your document and you say, do this expensive, expensive calculation, and while you're doing that, the user says, save my document. What that means is complete that calculation and then save. Right? So that's a good use of a future continuation. But if I knew I was going to do the operation in advance, I probably wanted to hand that operation to my async operation and say, call this completion handler when you're done. So my argument is that it shouldn't be a religious argument about whether or not we need A or B, we need both. Now the next thing you find is that what you want is joins, okay? So this is win all, 
right? What you want to be able to do is say, when I have these two values, then I'm going to execute the next task. And a lot of people think that win all would be implemented as a blocking call. They think that win all would be a task that would immediately block saying get A, then get B. And so when they're both ready, then it would continue. But that's not how win all works at all. So what win all does is it creates a little shared group. Okay? And the group has an atomic counter in it. Okay? And the counter is for the number of arguments that it's waiting for, for the win all. And so when the first task completes, it decrements that count. And when the second task completes, that count falls to zero. And so it's the task that caused it to fall to zero that invokes the continuation for the win all for what to do next. Okay? So win all isn't spinning up something that's waiting. It's just adding, it's attaching a little decoration and say, says win, keep decrementing my count. And when it hits zero, whoever decrements it to zero, call the next thing. So there's no, there's no waiting with a win all. So this is how a win all looks, right? I can calculate two Fibonacci numbers and then I can go ahead and I can say win all. Uh, then what I want to do is output, did I multiply those two together? Yeah, I want to output what the two are multiplied together. Now this is using the current proposed uh, 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 interface for win all and I'm not particularly happy with it because what my lambda gets called with there, which I have as, as auto f is the argument coming in, is I've got a future of tuples uh, wait, yeah, a future tuple where each element in the tuple is a future for my value, right? So eventually we will have an unwrap call that will let you unwrap it, but I think the, by default the interface should just be unwrapped. So you, what you get in your lambda is the set of functions you were waiting for. And if something went wrong with them, an exception is thrown through another channel. So yes, that's... Just what I said, F is a future tuple of futures. That result is 626,000 lines or digits, which I won't print. Now the next operation we would want is a split. This is not in the TS yet. I think it should be. When I first gave this talk, at this point, I gave a comment that said, I don't know how to layer on top of the existing TS a, a split. Um, uh, and then I saw one of Bartos's talk on category theory. And, and of all things, uh, uh, in my previous talk, I also mentioned a, a, a Kleisley category, which happens to be a very useful category. And Bartos was talking about this. And I said, this is very odd. Now I see how I can do split. So, Bartos gives me a hard time because he says this is the absolutely most non-functional use of category theory he's ever seen in his life. But let's see how we'd build a split. Okay. So first thing is this is what we, we conceptually want to do. Right? We want to do an async operation and then we want to do one thing with the result and we want to do something else with the same result. And we would think that we could just write this code. Okay? But we can't that code actually crashes. So the reason why that crashes is not a bug, it's because dot then consumes the future from x, okay? x on the first dot then there is actually moved into the continuation and what was in x is left as an empty shell. And so the second continuation is on a future which doesn't have any shared state and a precondition of calling dot then is that your future is valid and has a shared state and so we correctly crash. I have issues with this design uh, but let's see if we can fix it. Okay. What we really want is for x to behave as if it were a token for our value and we could just copy it, should be a regular type, move it around. So we can write a pseudo copy that I call split. Then our code would look like this, okay? We could say y equals split x then and then x dot then for our second continuation, okay? And we could have as many splits going on there as we wanted to, right? And the last one, we don't need the split. It's just going to consume x. Uh, 
And then we could put the results back together and we would get that. So let's see how we would write that. To understand how we would write this, we need to understand what promises are. Who knows what a promise is? Handful of people. A promise is the other end of a future, right? right? It's the sending side of a future. The typical way you get a promise is you create a package task, which helps with the exception marshalling. And so you take a function, you create a package task out of it, package task bundles up the promise side and gives you the future. So here's how promises work, right? I can create a promise, x int, and I always think the phrasing for promises is reversed, but that's how it is. And I can create a future, int y, and out of our promise I can get a future. So now I've got the promise is the sending side, the future is the receiving side, okay? And so I can set a value on my promise and that value comes out of my future. Right, everybody following that? So that's my basic building block for dealing with futures. That will print 42. So how are we going to split? Well, we'll break this code down. Okay, we start out with a future for x. And there's a light arrow that hardly shows up up there. Uh, but that arrow implies that there's a promise somewhere on the other end of that future that's gonna send the value. Okay, and we need that arrow to end up going to two places. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to move x into temp just to get it out of the way. Okay, so now our arrow goes into temp. Now we're going to create a new promise and extract from it a new future. Okay, and we're going to put the future where x was. And x is passed in by reference here, so we overwrote the future that was passed in. Then we're going to take temp, okay, and we're going to attach a con our, our continuation to it. And keep in mind that, that attaching the continuation is going to consume temp, okay? So now temp gets moved into what's going to become underscore temp, the argument there. Okay, so, so then we're gonna do something and the result of that, of that dot then, right, is a new future which we're gonna return, okay? Inside of our continuation, we're going to move P, right? You see it right there, right? We're gonna move P inside of our continuation, inside of that lambda, okay? And so now what happens when that lambda executes, it gets the value, okay? So that's the value coming in from temp. It gets the value. It sets the value on P, okay? Which sets it back through the future X. And it returns the value, which sends it out through here. Okay, so the resulting structure is that. Okay, so we successfully split a future into two things. Now we do need to handle just a little bit more, which is dot get could throw an exception. And we also want to split the exception and send the exception down to both. Okay. So here we do that. We just check to see if temp has, a, has an exception. If it does, we get the exception pointer. We set the exception on, on underscore P and then we rethrow the exception which will hand it off to the future that's returned from our split. Okay, so now we can split futures. Okay, so we can do that. Now cancellations, other than rewriting the whole system, I don't have a good answer for this. And I actually do have slides on how to rewrite the whole system, but it's way longer than we have time for. What you want is when the last future destructs is any operation that's leading up to that future that hasn't started to execute, you want it to not execute, okay? And to just no op. So eventually what happens is with these futures, I have futures attached to continuations and I've got splits and I've got joins and I've got some big graph I'm building up 
conceptually inside of my code. And if I decide, oh, hey, I don't need this value anymore, and I let that future destruct, what I want to have happen is say, well, if that operation hasn't started, don't start it, which should get rid of those two uh, uh, futures, right? They were held by that continuation. So those guys go, go away, and what I'm left with is just one chain coming down, right? So my tree can unravel as many levels as it needs. What happens right now if you destruct uh, an STD future, if the STD future came from async, it may block until the thread that it was issued on completes. Uh, it used to absolutely block in C++11, but in C++14, because it could be on a tasking pool, it may block. It's not required to. Um, uh, uh, if it doesn't block, it simply detaches, and all of your results get calculated and then thrown away, right? So you're doing additional work. If you've been following along here, what we're building with futures and promises and these, these tokens that we're passing around, we are building up dependency graphs. And these dependency graphs in your code can get quite large. And a future is an execute once thing, right? You get one value out of a future and then you're done with it. So if you actually watch a piece of code that's written with a lot of, of futures, what you will find is it will build this fairly complicated graph because each of these futures has some shared state somewhere, synchronization primitives around it. So, so behind the scenes, it's building this fairly sophisticated graph. And then you fire a value through it or, a, or you know, that flows out through this graph tearing the graph down as it goes, and then your code loops back around and says, hey, let's do that again. Let's build that graph one more time and stick a different value in it and tear it all down. And your code keeps doing that, right? So there can be a fair amount of overhead. So the idea with a channel is what if we can take the graph and we can persist it? Okay, what if when we build up this graph, if we can send multiple values down it without tearing it down every time? Right. So the Go language has something called Go routines and channels that connect Go routines. Okay, so that's an idea that's here. Right, that's what we want. Uh, the basic idea is also what you find if you've been reading about reactive programming models, okay, in which case, so, that should say channels are known as behaviors, okay? Each change triggers a notification to the sync value, and each operation within your graph then doesn't need to be a one-to-one -one mapping. I don't need to just stick a simple lambda in there. I could have a coroutine in there that generates a set of functions or a set of results. Uh, uh, or consumes a number of results and then outputs one, right? So I can have coroutines within my graph that act as generators or as accumulators. So if we had the ability in C++ to write with channels, they might look something like this, okay? We can create a channel called send, and using the pipe notation here, we can pipe, that's a coroutine to it, using co -await. okay? So what this guy's going to do is he's going to keep receiving values through co await summing them together. This is uh, Chandler's fa most uh, favorite loop here. Okay, so we're going to sum them together and then we're gonna fall out of this loop when co await returns that it's done and we'll return the sum, okay? And then the piping is just to attach the equivalent of continuations here. We're gonna print the result. Okay, so now we can send one, two, three into our channel and then close the channel to signal that we're done and that would output six, right? Would sum up those values. Now, if you actually sit out to build one of these things, you're gonna immediately find you've got a problem. Here's what happens. You build the graph and these guys are all running at different rates, okay? So very quickly what happens is you have a whole bunch of values stacked up so what you need is a form of flow control. So this guy puts out a value, and then he puts another value, and then he's stuck waiting 
right? Because that guy hasn't consumed it yet. Then he consumes it and signals back, hey, I got space for another value. So it's exactly the same thing as if you've ever done any programming on serial ports, which most of you are probably too young to have ever programmed serial ports. But if you have, um, uh, uh, it's exactly the same thing as doing serial port flow control, right? So channels have the additional complexity that you want serial port flow control. What would come next? If you think about an application, we're building up dependency graphs within in the application. We're persisting the dependency graphs, right? So we don't have to keep rebuilding them. And then we study those persistent dependency graphs. And what we would find is that within our application, there's a finite set of graphs that our application represents. So we have sections of the graph that are conditional, that can come and go. And we have sections of the graph that are effectively somehow mirror images of the same thing. They tend to represent the same thing, just flowing in different directions, right? So what you would find is that these functions aren't necessarily just a function that takes a couple values in and puts a value out, but it represents a relationship. Okay, and within your body of code, you have that same relationship represented, but you have it represented as multiple different functions for the different flows through that node. Okay, so maybe this is a multiplication thing here, so given any two values, I can define the third value, right? And in one part of your code, you did a multiplication, and in another part of your code, you did a division with the same set of numbers, but those really represent the same relationship just coming at it from a different direction. So what if we could take our channels, build up our graph, remove the arrows, okay? And that forms a type of constraint system that's known as a property model, okay? Where flow is determined by the priorities of cells, of values within the system. And relationships can be conditional, as I said, so long as the predicate can be determined regardless of the flow. Cells can only have one in edge, right? right? A given cell can only be determined along one edge or our system's over-constrained. And then we can start to think about how these things flow out. They each represent a state in our system. So how would something like this flow out in an asynchronous system, right? So we have source values coming in, flowing through our relationships. It determines the floor. So here we have two source values. That causes a flow through our graph, two sync values. Reflowing a property model doesn't require all the relationships to be resolved, which means I don't have to calculate the functions to figure out the flow of my graph. The only thing I need to calculate is anything that's dependent on a conditional, right? Otherwise, I can flow it simply based on priority of cells. Creates a single dependency graph for each flow, and over time, these things can be connected, right? So here, we have two states of our system. Right? We have a value set in source A and then source B, which causes a particular flow, but those are high latency operations, so those take time to flow out. Okay? And then a value is set in source C for the next state in our system, okay? causing a reflow. Right? But if you see there, the values in I's are connected. Those are going to be the same value between the two states of our system. We're just going to be they're attached with continuations effectively. So as we complete the flow from the first state, we'll continue the flow into the second state of our system. And our system will just continue to keep, keep running and settle out on the right value. So the result that we end up with is, is, is like that. Now these graphs have some interesting properties. Uh, they're very useful for UI behaviors, which is why I actually started with them. Uh, there's significant information that's hidden inside the graph itself. Source and derived values form a partition set. What I mean by that is, is very simple. It's just that every item in, in a property model for a given state of the property model is either a source or it's derived, so it partitions it in, into two sections. But further, the source values are order independent, provably. 
within these graphs. And that means that if you very quickly want to check one of these graphs to make sure that no matter what order the user sets information in or information is coming in over the network in, and it's solvable for any combination of values, it's a very quick algorithm to do that model check. Equal results regardless of source order also means that these things form what's known as an operational transform. Who knows what an operational transform is? Wow, nobody. Okay, uh, so an operational transform is, is a very particular construct that says that regardless of the order that we're editing things in, so long as we make the same edits, we will end up at the same place. So this has huge ramifications if you want to build a distributed system because what it means is every user of the system okay, that's collaborating on a single centralized model, every user sees a linearly consistent view of the universe, right? Everything for them seems to be going forward either in reaction to the changes that they made or if somebody else makes a change, when that change comes in, it comes in sequentially after them. They never go back in time, even if the other user actually made that change before they made their change. Okay, so every user sees a linearly consistent view of the world and at the end you have a guarantee that the system will reach the same state. So, so given enough time, all your users in the system will end up at the same place. But they will each have a different view of how they got there. Okay, so this is very important if you want to build a collaborative editing system. Okay, it's also very important in a lot of networking applications. Okay. So other information that's in the graph. A value within the graph is implied by the current state if it has only one in edge, if there's no way to have an out edge on that, on that system. Okay, so it has one edge that's fixed coming in. Okay. So source values within the system form what's called the intent of the system, right? So if you want to do a scripting system, like Photoshop has this scripting system called Actions that does intelligent recording and playback, okay? What you want to do is capture the user's intent. What I mean by that is if the user says, make my document be three inches wide constraining proportions, what you want to record is make my document be three inches wide constraining proportions. What you don't want to record is the command that was actually executed, which is make, make my document be 300 pixels by 500 pixels, because that would take all of your documents, regardless of their aspect ratio, and make them 300 pixels by 500 pixels. Okay? The source values are the intent. And you can't just look at what the user changed because if you did, maybe the user changed both width and height and so you would record three inches by five inches constraining proportions, which makes no sense, okay? So you have to understand all of the relationships in order to capture the intent. Okay. And finally, values disconnected from the result or sync are don't care values and that can be very useful to know in your system too. As you start to think through the ramifications of concurrency and asynchronous code, I start to think that maybe even though futures are the minimal transformation to represent a dependency graph, maybe writing in an imperative system, right, where we pretend that it's C++ code that we're executing when under the hood what we're actually doing is we're building up dependency graphs and tearing them down and mutating the dependency graphs is very much the wrong level to be coding in, right? Maybe instead we want to start to talk about the graph explicitly and mine the graph for information. Uh, my slides are available uh, for all my presentations at the link that's there. You'll also find uh, papers that I've written on property models, mostly in collaboration with Yako Yarve at, formerly at Texas A&M, now at uh, University of Oslo, I believe. Um, uh, there's also an experimental future library uh, that's up here that does have cancellation, and I've got an experimental implementation of channels up here. Uh, same GitHub website, but it's a different repository, is an implementation of property models, if, if anybody wants to look at property models and play with those. So finally, no raw synchronization primitives. <laughs>
right? Start to think differently about how you write code so that code doesn't block, so that code can be very high performance and can run without stopping, right? Really what we're talking about here is communicating sequential processes. Uh, how, how many people know Tony Hoare's book on, on CSP? Nobody again. Okay, so Tony Hoare, classic computer scientist, wrote a great book in the 1970s, Communicating Sequential Processes. This is the foundation of the Go language and Go routines. Okay, this is the fundamental theoretical underpinnings of everything I talked about here, right? right? And I think if more people on the standards committee had read and grokked communicating sequential tasks, that we wouldn't have deadlocking gets on our futures right now. So write better code. And I'm gonna open it up for questions. I think we only have literally four minutes for four one minutes or two quick ones. So just a brief question or two. Hey, what do you think about a wait concept introduced by Microsoft a few years ago? Uh, which concept introduced uh, by Microsoft? I think await. And oh, the oh, operating oh. of the concurrency by the state machine. Right, right. Uh, so, 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 so async await or their coroutine work. Um, uh, I think the, the coroutine work is a fundamental building block here. When I got to the point where, where I was showing channels, um, I used an example using, using co await, which is async await, which is, is the coroutine operation. Um, uh, 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 coroutines are absolutely critical if you want if you want high performance task system without jumping through backflips to write code, right? Writing a communicating sequential process without a coroutine either means you're spinning it up on a thread, which is very resource heavy, or you're doing backflips writing very sophisticated state machine as a as a function object, which can get very tedious very fast. Um, when I talked about taking our rendering system to JavaScript, uh, the way that I did that was I went through, it was not a huge number of places, but I went through sections in the code where we had producer-consumer patterns which required concurrency to execute. And I had to take that code, and since I didn't have coroutine facilities uh, within Clang, I had to manually uh, uh, do the transform of the producer-consumer states into coroutines so that I could task chain the coroutines to get everything to run. Uh, and that is a very painful operation to do. Um, I also have arguments with people frequently. I really fundamentally think that if you're going to build a system that's going to scale to many, many cores, you absolutely have to build it so that you can scale down to one core. Okay, if you cannot run single-threaded one core, then you do not know how much concurrency your application requires. You only know that it requires more than one core. And usually the answer is, is some n under some situation or you deadlock, okay? So, so if you really wanna build scalable code, you have to make sure it runs down to one thread. And the only way to do that is with, with a coroutine system. The only good practical way to do it is with coroutines. So I chat with Gore at Microsoft about this stuff quite a bit. Um, um. I'm, I'm afraid we need to wrap this up, Sean. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, Sean Parent.